Not that he became an overnight sensation. Born in Piacenza, Italy in 1934, Armani worked for nine years in well-known fashion house Nino Ceruti before finally setting up shop with partner Sergio Galliotti. Hello Magazine wrote that the menswear business was originally funded with the meager proceeds raised by selling their Volkswagen in 1974. Tired of seeing men dressing in the same uniform way, a trend he describes as the Mao syndrome, Armani quickly established a new standard of understated elegance and easy fit garments, fashioning Haute Couture's very first unlined jacket. He translated this relaxed style into an androgynous label for women in 1975. He's never been a fan of the extravagance often put on by other designers during fashion shows, and his clothes are famous for eliminating the superfluous to emphasize elegance and comfort. His mastery of style really came to the fore a few years later with the Armani Power Suit, underpinning the boardroom power of both male and female go-getters during the economic boom of the early 1980s. Giorgio Armani became the first fashion designer to appear on the cover of Time magazine since Christian Dior. A determined go-getter himself, he became one of the first designers to actively approach celebrities about wearing his designs, and confirmed Armani fans include LA Lakers coach Pat Wiley and film stars Jodie Foster, Sophia Loren and Michelle Pfeiffer. At a recent Armani retrospective at the Royal Academy of Arts in London, more than 500 of his garments were on display many of which started life on the red carpet at the Oscars or in one of the many films and stage productions Armani has designed the costumes for. His impressive list of film credits include gangster classic The Untouchables, along with Cadillac Man, Stealing Beauty, Ransom and The Comfort of Strangers. He set a trend with Eddie Murphy's famous suit in 48 hours, although he takes a dim view of the current passion for fads. Now everything is a trend, everything is mixed, not even creators have a personality. Trend kills creativity, it kills personal research. If one has the gift to be creative, then one has the right and the duty to be creative and show it. It's what I've always been trying to do. and he has no intention of retiring from the fashion forefront. No, I know that my age, many people are in pension, but I see a lot of people in pension. I know that people of my age retire. I see retired people as very sad. I feel exactly as I did when I started. I have something left because I have some more years. I'm more detached from things, more mature. My enthusiasm is the same every time as it was for my first collection. Now it's even worse, because then I could afford to make mistakes. If I go wrong today, everyone will be on me. Some are there waiting for it. It looks like they may be waiting for quite a while longer. Coming up, Michelangelo. From the finest haute couture of one Italian master to the priceless artwork of another. A record-breaking Michelangelo exhibition is giving a rare insight into the drawings the artist didn't want anyone to see. Michelangelo Drawings Closer to the Master is the first Michelangelo exhibit at the British Museum in 30 years and has attracted almost 11,000 advance bookings. The display features 90 drawings by the Italian Renaissance sculptor, painter, poet and architect from collections in the British Museum, the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford and the Taylor Museum in Holland. 
It includes a collection of thumbnail sketches and red chalk studies which reveal the genesis of the painting of the Sistine Chapel roof in the Vatican Palace. Also on display are black and white chalk studies for the Last Judgment on the altar wall of the Sistine Chapel, architectural drawings for the Basilica of St. Peter's, and the drawings of the Crucifixion, which changed in style as Michelangelo reached the end of his own life. Well, he did have, uh, Michelangelo had a very, very long career. We know that he was working as an apprentice at the age of 12, and he was working until right at the end of his life when he was uh, 88. And he did all sorts, he was a painter, he was a sculptor, he was an architect, and as you say, he was a poet. And you see all those, the thing that links all of those except for poetry is, is, is drawing. He, he, before he began to paint, to sculpt, to, to think about uh, designing a building, he would do that on paper. Drawing was central to everything he did. Born in Tuscany in 1475, Michelangelo was the best documented artist of the 16th century. Despite his low opinion of painting, he created two of the most influential fresco paintings in Western art, on the ceiling and altar wall of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. Chapman pointed out Michelangelo himself would not have wanted people to see the technical work that went into his final masterpieces. I think he wants you to go and look at his finished work and not realise the labour that went into it. But I think looking at his drawings, you come away with a huge, enhanced appreciation of, of Michelangelo's genius. So I think in that respect he was wrong. Chapman believes the collection at the British Museum sheds a unique light on the man behind the masterpieces and his techniques. Between 1500 and 1504, Michelangelo sculpted David, which was to become the most recognizable statue in history, as well as an international symbol of strength and youthful human beauty. I think you do gain an understanding about Michelangelo by looking at his drawings. You first you get an idea that how amazingly hard working he is, how driven he is. He's not somebody who's going to accept the mediocre. He's always going to keep on working and refining and working out ideas on paper until he's reached a, a satisfactory conclusion. And the other thing that we see is is a really great religious artist. Michelangelo was somebody who really believed in heaven, believed in hell, and that gives his religious art an incredible uh, power. Working right up until his death at the age of 88, Michelangelo spent the last few years of his life making a number of drawings of the crucifixion, writing much of his finest poetry, as well as carving the Pieta, which was originally intended for his own tomb. Having acquired a taste for Italian craftsmanship, you might want to drive away in one of these. 35 historic Ferraris dating from 1951 to 1989 went on auction at the exclusive Swiss resort of Gestad. The top lot, a 1961 Ferrari 250 GT, fetched over one and a half million Swiss francs. Yellow, blue, white, silver, black, and of course red. There was one for every taste at Bonham's annual Ferrari sale in the exclusive Swiss resort. Should we say 475? 475 is bid at 475. 1 million 475 against you now, so another 25. Bonham's Europe's fourth Ferrari sale took over 5 million US dollars. 475. One five, one million four hundred and seventy-five thousand. It's going away, sir. The nicest, the quickest of these you'll find. One four seven five. Proven race history, and selling now. If there's no better bid, it's against you. We're selling the car. Are you all done? No more. 
the Queen Mary II may no longer reign as the world's largest cruise ship, but it still wears the crown when it comes to luxury. Relaunched in 2003 after a £550 million overhaul, Cunard's prized superliner spends most of the year ferrying guests between Southampton in England and New York. It stretches 345 metres in length. That's more than 40 metres longer than the Eiffel Tower and weighs three times the weight of the Titanic. There's space aboard for more than 2,600 passengers with almost one crew member for every two guests. The vessel's 17 decks include five swimming pools, sweeping staircases, a grand ballroom, a 360-degree promenade deck, and a host of luxury shops. There's a theater as well as a cinema. There's a casino, and there's an art gallery with three million pounds worth of works on display for purchase. And of course, there's gourmet food in abundance, thanks to the ship's 15 restaurants and bars. Her designer, Stephen Michael Payne, is a truly proud man. Well, Queen Mary II is a true liner. She has all the attributes of the liner. She has the strong hull. She has the pyramid shape. She has the engines that are almost twice the power of a normal cruise ship. And more importantly, she has the hull shape that enables her to go through rough weather without damaging herself and yet making it very comfortable for her passengers. The cabins have the feel and look of a top-class hotel. Each Queen Mary II stateroom is matched with a reserved table at one of the ship's sea view restaurants. And complimentary room service is available 24 hours a day. And when one tires of a life on the ocean wave, well, there's always shopping. Or an opportunity to enjoy some pampering at the world-renowned Canyon Ranch Spa Club. If you're into health and fitness, there's a state-of-the-art gym and weight room, plus a well-equipped sports deck. Or how about a visit to the planetarium, a wine-tasting seminar, or a walk down History Lane at the Maritime Quest exhibit? When the stars come out in the night sky, the Queen Mary II plays host to some very elegant soirees. Dancers sweep across the Queen's room, hors d'oeuvres are served in Sir Samuel's wine bar, there's jazz in the Commodore Club, musical shows in the Royal Court Theatre, or you can spin over to the casino with its tuxedoed croupiers, then head down to the G32 disco. Or just retire to the chart room and the crooning tunes of a cabaret singer. Next time on Desire, a look at the very glamorous life of Nicole Kidman. We go backstage with Italian icon Valentino. We sneak a peek inside the world's most expensive car. And take a tour of the very royal Monaco. Remember to be careful what you wish for, you may just get it.